Om Bhagata Chita Hari Krishna Kama Sutra Om Dollar Dollar Bills 8.5 Million Dollar Mansion in LA with a pool and a sauna Om in the Tesla Om Om Buddha Bar Lounge Music Om Shisha Om Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boy. Hello, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hello, my name is Cam. And if you're not new and you keep coming back again and again, thank you. I really appreciate you. Today's video is brought to you by my lovely Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for the support, you guys. I really appreciate it. Patreon is a platform where I post more personal kind of videos. And I've started to post my videos that I post on this channel in advance on Patreon. If you're interested in that type of madness, there's the link in the description below. And with that, let's get into the video. Um, help me get to 20 patrons. Um, by the end of this year. In today's video, we're doing a book and person review. <laughs> and we're talking about a very enlightened person, a very wise, self-aware kind of person that used to be a monk, the one and only Jay Shetty. We're gonna discuss this book, Think Like a Monk. I've read this book. It's a lot. I hope you guys really appreciate these videos because actually it takes so much out of me to read these self-help books. Look at that. I get angry all the time. I have comments to make all the time when I'm reading these books. Let's start off with a general introduction on who this person is. Very early on, I started to experiment with what mattered to me. Jay Shetty is a self-help guru, YouTuber, podcaster, general know-it-all. He was a former monk, and this is how he actually rose to fame in the self-help industry. But he's not like other monks, you guys. We just read How Are You Really by Jenna Kutcher, and Jenna is not like other gurus. Well, Jay is not like other monks. In what sense do I mean that, I hear you ask? Well, for starters, Jay Shetty is obsessed with being a billionaire. He keeps talking about that. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one. But not everyone is gonna go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. He's very aware of the struggles of everyday men and that can be noticed on multiple instances, such as the following paragraph on page 69. Happiness and fulfillment come only from mastering the mind and connecting with the soul, not from objects or attainments, writes Jay. Success doesn't guarantee happiness and happiness doesn't require success. They can feed each other and we can have them at the same time, but they are not intertwined. After analyzing a Gallup survey on well-being, Princeton University researchers officially concluded that money does not buy happiness after basic needs and then some are fulfilled. While having more money contributes to overall life satisfaction, that impact levels off at a salary of around $75,000. In other words, writes Jay Shetty. When it comes to the impact of money on how you view the quality of your life, a middle-class American citizen fares about as well as Jeff Bezos. You heard it here first. You guys are just as happy as Jeff Bezos. Not me, because I don't make $70, um, $75,000 a year, but you know, uh, someday. <laughs> so <laughs> very self-aware, very enlightened, not like other monks, all that stuff, yeah? Jay is different than other monks through other things as well, such as being married to a woman. And monks, or real monks in general, tend to not marry, right? <laughs> they lead a life of abstinence, as far as I know, but not Jay. Jay is married to a woman by the name Roddy, um, and she's absolutely gorgeous, but they are extremely similar in um, the kind of content that they post. I'm about to show you my three favorite breathworks that I have used for years for my anxiety. Not only is their content similar, but they just look freakishly similar, don't you find? I would not be surprised if they were like cousins or something. And he's also different than other monks in the fact that while other monks live in like ashrams and sleep on the floor and they live in like difficult conditions to say the least, Jay doesn't do that. He's also different than them in the fact that he lives in an $8.5 million mansion in LA. But don't worry you guys, he's self-aware. Detachment is not that you own nothing. 
Detachment is that nothing owns you. And that's what matters most. On page 15 of Roman Numbers, Jay writes, These days I still consider myself a monk, though I usually refer to myself as a former monk, since I'm married and monks aren't permitted to marry. I live in LA, which people tell me is one of the world capitals of materialism, facade, fantasy and overall dodginess. People tell you that? No, he's super self- I promise he's self-aware. Now, if that doesn't sound like a very modest monk type of life, I don't know what to tell you. He definitely is a monk. He considers himself a monk. But I have a theory that Jay may have been a little bit not very good at being a monk. <laughs> First of all, there's been some comments on the internet that claim that he may have never been a monk in the first place because apparently the picture that he keeps posting about being a monk is a picture in which he's only wearing like an orange hoodie and like a scarf and he has a shaved head. So people are just kind of speculating that maybe he was never a monk and he just invented this whole thing. I don't know that I believe that, but it's a funny theory. However, I think that he may have been a shitty monk <laughs> and um, I think it's because Jay writes Three years after I moved to M Mumbai, my teacher Gauranga Das told me that he believed I would be of greater value and service if I left the ashram and shared what I'd learned with the world. This to me sounds like he was asked to leave in the most polite way. So I don't know, was he a shitty monk? Is there like a way to quantify what monks do, do they get like monk grades or something? I don't know, but between stealing quotes, plagiarizing, being married, living in LA of all places, and not only in LA, but in an $8.5 million mansion in LA, I don't know that he was so good at being a monk or that he even enjoyed it at all. You might have noticed from the clips that I've inserted thus far, Jay has a little bit of an accent, doesn't he? He is from England. Well, his parents are Indian, but he has lived his entire life in England. Jay's family has lived in North London, which is one of the most expensive neighborhoods in Britain which is one of the most expensive countries in the world. He gives me the general impression that he comes from a very privileged background. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with coming from a privileged background. I'm just saying that's not something that he uh, advertises very much. For as long as I've known, I've been chasing thrill. Mm. I really value thrill. I was experimenting with all the drugs in the world. I had multiple relationships. A bowl of ice cream, a bump of cocaine. Those are pleasurable, Absolutely. and I, I haven't done the coke, but the ice cream I can speak for. Okay, I've done both. Good. <laughs> I've done both. Good. <laughs> In his teenage years, he decided to go to university, and he went to the Cass Business School. After going to university for business, he then interned in a financial institution, and one of his first jobs was as a consultant for a corporation called Accenture, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a tech company. Between that and quotes like this... But not everyone is going to go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. I have a feeling that Jay is the kind of monk or the kind of former monk that really adores money. This is for the camera. In one of my previous videos, uh, the one I talked about, Jenna Kutcher, I mentioned how she picked on Marie Kondo. Well, I'm not sure why these self-help gurus are so obsessed with Marie Kondo, but Jay Shetty also mentions her twice in his book. On page 16, he says, We humans cling to stuff. People, ideas, material possessions, copies of Marie Kondo's book. <laughs> Thinking it's unnatural to purge, but letting go is a direct route to space, literally in stillness. I'm not sure what that meant. Like, this, how did this sound to you? He then mentions Marie Kondo again on page 165 in potentially a less passive-aggressive way. A more recent window is tidying up with Marie Kondo, the show where Kondo helps people declutter their lives. And at the end, over and over again, you'll see people weeping with relief and joy at having purged so much. That's because they've just dramatically decreased the number of things they're attached to. Attachment brings pain. If you think something is yours or you think some, you are something, then it hurts to have it taken away from you. Yeah, fair enough. In this paragraph, it doesn't sound as passive aggressive as before, but still, I just don't understand what is the obsession with Marie Kondo. I never read the book. Maybe you should read the book. It seems to me like these self-help gurus are very aware that Marie Kondo is a success. She actually has like real value to offer, unlike these people, you know what I mean? You can take a fish out of water and give it a beautiful mansion and a Bentley and all the money in the world, but it will die. 
Now, when we talk about self-help, we often discuss an idea that is called toxic positivity because for some reason, the self-help industry is obsessed with toxic positivity. Jay Shetty has plenty of that. But in this uh, chapter, negativity is everywhere. He addresses negativity and he addresses internet trolls as he calls them or as he calls us he says think of the trolls who dive onto social media dumping ill will on their targets perhaps their fear is that they aren't respected and they turn to trolling to feel significant or perhaps their political beliefs are generating the fear that their world is unsafe or maybe they're just trying to build a following fear certainly doesn't motivate every troll in the world and what i want to say to that is i uh, love being a troll. Maybe that's also some of the motivation, you know, loving the act of trolling Jay Shetty. That's definitely something that brings me a lot of joy in my life. And since I don't have a lot of joy in my life, I'm going to take this. <laughs> Sorry, Jay. In the same chapter, Jay goes on to explain how we can categorize neg negative people, such as complainers, counselors, casualties, critics, commanders, competitors, controllers. They're all starting with C for some reason. And then he says, you can have fun with this list, seeing if you can think of someone to fit each type. You know where to put me, <laughs> I think. I personally love it when self-help gurus address the critics because every time they get so defensive. And I'm sorry, Jay, but like we're here to criticize you. You're here to be a public person and we're here to give the world our opinion. So, and none of us is going anywhere. I'm, I can tell you that. On page 35, Jay writes, the Bhagavad Gita refers to the austerity of speech, saying that we should only speak words that are truthful, beneficial to all, pleasing, and that don't agitate the minds of others. But I am here to actually agitate your minds, you guys. I want you to get as agitated as I am about the self-help industry or against the self-help industry. He also writes, criticizing someone else's work ethic doesn't make you work harder. Well, criticizing the lack of ethics of the self-help industry is actually my work. So it does make me work harder because if you give me things to criticize, I will have more work to do. So thank you. Um. Further on, I want to mention a couple of stories that just give us a little bit of an impression of how uh, Jay is as a person. So on page 209, there's a story in which Jay attempts to acknowledge his privilege a little bit. He writes this story in a way that rubs me the wrong way for some reason. I think it's the conclusion that he drew from that that really just didn't sit very well with me. I first visited India with my parents when I was around nine years old. In a taxi on our way back to the hotel, we stopped at a red light. Out the window, I saw the legs of a girl, probably the same age as me. The rest of her was bent over deep into a trash can. It looked like she was trying to find something, most likely food. When she stood up, I realized with shock that she didn't have hands. He makes the story all about how he then went on to have dinner with his parents somewhere and he kept on thinking about the girl that was eating from the trash can and she didn't have hands, etc. So he tries to sound compassionate, but the way that this sounds at the end here really just doesn't... It's very I'm better than thou type thing. The biggest difference between me and that girl was where and to whom we had been born. My father, in fact, had worked his way out of the slums in Pune, not far from Mumbai. I was the product of immense hard work and sacrifice. I don't know what makes him think that maybe that didn't happen to the girl. Maybe she was also the product of hard work and sacrifice but maybe her parents didn't have the same level of privilege. Maybe her parents didn't have the same education, didn't have any means. I don't know how she ended up there, but the reason this story doesn't sit very well with me is because it sounds like he's saying that his father worked hard to get out of the slums of Pune while that girl's father didn't do that. And he doesn't know anything about that girl or that girl's father or that girl's mother or whatever situation that she was in. Like he has no idea, but for some reason he kind of passed judgment on that. Now tell me if I'm wrong on this, maybe my instincts are off a little bit, but it just, it didn't sit well with me. Okay, moving on. There's like some weird stories in here and you probably have uh, come to notice that by now, but here's another one. Jay has an entire chapter talking about the ego and uh, 
I don't know if he means it in the same way that Gabby Bernstein meant it, like as in not in the psychological way, but on page 180, he talks about institutional ego and he writes, Nan Ian, a Zen master, received the university professor who had come to inquire about Zen. When Nan Ian served tea, he poured his visitor's cup full and then kept on pouring. The professor watched the overflow until he no longer could restrain himself. It's so overfull, no more will go in. Like this cup, Nanian said, you are full of your own opinions and speculations. How can I show you Zen unless you first empty your cup? You can only be filled up with knowledge and rewarding experiences if you allow yourself to be empty. On page 216, he writes a story that kind of gives a little bit of an insight into his private life, if you will. I hopped in an Uber once in a hurry and distracted. The car idled for an unusually long time. And when I finally noticed and asked the driver if everything was okay, he said, yes, I'm just waiting for you to say hi back to me. So Jay doesn't say hi to people like Uber drivers or didn't until that point, because that was a wake up call for him. It kind of sounds like a bit of a narcissist, someone who thinks that he's above you because uh, like those are the people that don't like acknowledge people who in, in the service industry of some sorts, like they think they're above or something. I, that's kind of how I read this story. And now obviously he's making this whole story about what he learned from that experience and like etc. But it still gives us a little bit of an insight into how he acts or how he acted up until that point. He doesn't say when this happened, but I'm pretty sure this was as an adult, so um, past the monk days. On page 46, he starts a chapter called Fear and he writes, Sometimes fear is a critical warning to help us survive true danger, but most of the time what we feel is anxiety related to everyday concerns about money, jobs and relationships. We allow anxiety, everyday fear, to hold us back by blocking us from our true feelings. The longer we hold on to fears, the more they ferment until eventually they become toxic. And I have a question. If you are a self-help guru watching this, which you're probably not, hopefully, what is the obsession that you guys have with oversimplifying anxiety and other mental health disorders? Mel Robbins has done it. Tony Robbins has done it. Grant Cardone has done it. I don't get what is so appealing about you guys taking a job at mental health. Mental health is no joke. Mental health disorders are debilitating. There's more to mental health than just anxiety and depression and you know at least Grant Cardone acknowledges that he has ADHD but like genuinely just I don't understand why people oversimplify mental health disorders. Anxiety uh, as someone who does have anxiety a lot like it's not something that it's necessarily coming from fear it's just something that is there and you have to work through it. I don't know how to explain it because it's a disorder, but I don't think it would be a good idea for me to try to explain it because I have no qualifications in mental health for me to try to explain anxiety or to give any advice relating to it. And neither does Jay. Jay Shetty, like Mel Robbins, who was a lawyer, like Grant Cardone, who I don't even know why he, but he definitely does not have any qualifications in mental health disorders. None of the people in the self-help industry, except for the holistic psychologist who actually did get a PhD in psychology, but she's in self-help for some reason. Her license has been revoked apparently. But anyways, aside from her, who actually has some knowledge of psychology, I don't understand why the self-help people go there. Why do they go to discuss anxiety and depression? They don't know anything about it. And I just, they oversimplify it. It's invalidating to people who have it. It does not offer any sort of solutions that will work for people with mental health disorders because they don't know how to help people. They don't know you in the first place. So they could never help you because they don't know you and what kind of disorder you have and what kind of help you need. And that's why you need to go to a therapist and talk to them one-on-one -on -one so they, they can get to know what your problem is and can help you with a solution for you. These people are just like I am right now in front of a camera. I have no idea who the person watching this is. Aside from like some names that I know because we comment back and forth, I would never know what kind of disorder you have and what kind of solutions you need. So <laughs> it's just, it would be ridiculous for me to sit here and be like, you know, just breathe. 
Have you guys thought about breathing? Because they say things like this, like he says on page 51, when you deal with fear and hardship, you realize that you're capable of dealing with fear and hardship. There are so many people who deal with hardship, aside from knowing that they're capable of going through fear and hardship, they might actually be left with trauma, CPTSD, PTSD, who knows what else. His solution to your fear and hardships and anxieties and worries and so on is this. Rate your fear. Draw a line with zero at one end and ten at the other. What's the worst thing you can imagine? Maybe it's a paralyzing injury or losing a loved one. Make that a ten on the line. Now rate your current fear in relation to that one. Just doing this helps give some perspective. When you feel fear crop up, rate it. Where does it fall next to something that's truly scary? So your fear is not actually truly scary. <laughs> that's what he's saying. It's very invalidating. And aside from his advice of rating your fear by invalidating your own fear, he also writes a story in this chapter that has absolutely nothing to do with fear whatsoever. <laughs> a few decades ago, scientists conducted an experiment in the Arizona desert where they built Biosphere 2, a huge steel and glass enclosure with air that had been purified, clean water, nutrient-rich soil, and lots of natural light. It was meant to provide ideal living conditions for the flora and fauna within. And while it was successful in some ways, in one it was an absolute failure. Over and over, when trees inside the biosphere grew to a certain height, they would simply fall over. At first, the phenomenon confused scientists. Finally, they realized that the biosphere lacked a key element necessary to the tree's health wind. In a natural environment, trees are buffeted by wind. They respond to that pressure and agitation by growing stronger bark and deeper roots to increase their stability. What does this have to do with anxiety and fear? Because it doesn't, like obviously he's gonna make it all about how you just get stronger because of the things that are thrown at you. And I think in some people do, probably, hopefully, and I think in some situations maybe you can get stronger through things, but I don't know, too much hardship, for example, can be very traumatic. But let's take a break from the negativity about Jay's book and look at one of the very first things that he said that actually I appreciate. On page 77, Jay writes, I don't believe in wishful manifesting, the idea that if you simply believe something will happen, it will. We can't sit around with true intentions, expecting that what we want will fall into our laps. Nor can we expect someone to find us, discover how amazing we are, and hand us a place in the world. Nobody is going to create our lives for us. I appreciate that. First of all, thank you. Thank you for talking against manifesting. And that's a dose of realism that I appreciate. I will say this book is not as bad as other self-help books. There are some things in here. There's a lot more actionable advice from Jay uh, than I've seen in other books. So. There is something good about this book, but but we still have loads to discuss before we get to the conclusions, okay? One of the things that drove me absolutely crazy about this book is just how much Jay writes about breathing. If you didn't know, life begins with breath. Breath carries you through all of your days and life and breath end together. Did you guys know that? I bet you didn't. On page 35, he writes, When we're stressed, we hold our breath and clench our jaws. We need to remember to breathe. On page 83, he writes, Developing a meditation practice with breath work is a natural way to support this intention. I recommend using breath work as a reminder to live at your own pace in your own time. Breath work helps you to understand that your way is unique and that's as it should be. And then on page 84, he has an entire chapter called Breathe, because you forgot since page 83. And um, that's all about breathing. So if you guys didn't remember to breathe today, this is your cue, <laughs> okay? On top of reminding people to breathe, this book also has something that I have come to call toddler advice. It's advice for toddlers, which as the denomination might indicate, 
is advice for three, four, five year olds. Toddlers are about three, three years old, right? For example, on page 102, he writes, we have to identify our passions, the activities we both love and are naturally inclined to do well. So if you have a two year old at home, show him this book. Another groundbreaking original piece of advice for toddlers uh, can be found on page 216, where he writes, to receive gratitude with humility, start by thanking the person for noticing. In other words, if somebody says something nice about your dress let's say um hey i love your dress it's very pretty you have to receive the compliment with gratitude and humility and you start by thanking the person for noticing so you say thank you this whole thing i got it for a discount in a charity shop like 10 years ago after you thank the person you appreciate their attention and their intentions you just smile at them (laughs) or give them a slap or something You look for a good quality in the other person and return the compliment. So you see that they have nice hair and you say, your dress is also nice. I think we're taking the piss a little too much. I've been talking for like over an hour at this point. Now, one of the things that Jay wrote in this book that was like extremely funny to me because it just showed me how detached from reality Jay actually is. Um, was in his chapter Dharma Profiles, in which he has split like the categories of people into the maker, the guide, the creator, and the leader. He goes on to explain what each category is, and he would say creators, originally they were merchants, business people, and today they are marketers, salespeople, entertainers, producers, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and they are great at sales, negotiation, and persuasion highly driven by money, pleasure, and success, excel in trade, commerce, and banking. And as a content creator myself, I couldn't agree more. I am excellent um, at sales, negotiation, and persuasion. I am highly driven by money. That is why I do YouTube uh, and I make like $100 a month. No, support me on Patreon if you can afford it because that will help me eat that month. Um. And uh, I definitely excel in trade, commerce, and banking. In the category of leaders, he says they they were originally kings and warriors, and today military, justice, law enforcement, and politics. So politicians, that's what I have in mind when I'm reading this, they protect those who are less privileged, um, such as not taxing billionaires. And uh, they are led by higher morals and values and seek to enforce them across the world. Uh, Yeah, totally. That just really exactly is what politicians today are doing. Um, So this chapter made me think that Jay does not live on this planet. So I don't know what planet he lives on, but he also says for Jay Shetty, things like taking out the trash are like character building. So I don't really, like we generally don't live in the same world because like he writes, for all of us out there, there are activities in life that are competence building and activities that are character building. When I was first asked to give talks, I built competence in my Dharma, but when I was asked to take out the trash, it built my character. And on page 184, he says, performing mundane tasks at an ashram isn't exactly replicable in the modern world. So in his world, in the modern world, he does not perform mundane tasks, such as taking out the trash. But he did it once and it really built his character. On page 123, he starts a chapter called Routine in which he talks all about his morning routine. He also had an evening routine as a monk at the ashram. He thinks routines are very important. And that is something that Jenna Kutcher would disagree with. Screw the morning routine, screw all that. But this is very holier than thou as per usual. He starts the chapter by writing, there are 12 of us, maybe more, sleeping on the floor, each on a thin yoga type pad, covered by a simple sheet. Eventually, I learned the one infallible trick to successfully getting up earlier. I had to go to sleep earlier. If you guys didn't know, that was it. I'd spend my entire life pushing the limits of each day, sacrificing tomorrow because I didn't want to miss out on today. But once I finally let go and started going to sleep earlier, waking up at four became easier and easier. And as it became easier, I found that I could do it without the help of anyone or anything besides my own body and the natural world around it. Jay Shetty is better even than Rachel Hollis because Rachel wakes up at 5 a.m. Most people won't get up at 4 a.m. How could I have forgotten? No, 
Rachel wakes up at 4 a.m. She's the queen of 4 a.m. And here's me claiming that she woke up at 5 a.m. There are also some contradictory points that he makes in this book. And I find that this is true across the board in the self-help industry. Like this industry is made of like insane contradictions. For example, on page 155, he says, insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting different results. This quote is often attributed to Einstein, although there's no proof that he ever said it. How many of us do the same thing year after year, hoping our lives will transform? So doing the same thing over and over again is insanity, yeah? Okay, well on page 95, he has this bizarre story. He has multiple bizarre stories, I'll read you some. Uh, he says, two monks were washing their feet in a river when one of them realized that a scorpion was drowning in the water. He immediately picked it up and set it upon the bank. Though he was quick, the scorpion stung his hand. He resumed washing his feet. The other monk said, hey, look, that foolish scorpion fell right back in. The first monk leaned over, saved the scorpion again, and was again stung. The other monk asked him, brother, why do you rescue the scorpion when you know its nature is to sting? Because, the monk answered, to save it is my nature. Don't scorpions kill you when they sting? Does this story sound fake to you? Because it kind of sounds to me like you might die if a scorpion stings you. Now, I don't know this, fact check me if you, if you know more information. If you live in Australia, down under, let me know. Doesn't this sound like, you know, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over, over and over again and uh, expecting different results? So what happened to this monk who kept on getting stung by the scorpion and that would keep going back in the water? Like, isn't that insanity? Is he trying to say that this monk is insane, that monks are insane? Because they definitely are from what he describes in the next story. I don't think I ever met a monk. But uh, the next story makes me think that there is a level of insanity that has to go into doing that as a career. Is that a career? Or as a lifestyle. On page 168 he writes, Sokushinbutsu is the name for a Japanese style of self-mumification practice where monks would eat a diet of pine needles, tree barks and resins then give up food and water while they continued to chant mantras until eventually their bodies petrified. Yeah that sounds um, like torture. I, I don't know if that has anything to do with um, being in control of your emotions or being in control of your body. I feel like this is some sort of obsession with death or something. As you might expect, there's a few mentions of the Dalai Lama and how he is the embodiment of calm and self-restraint. And to that, all I want to say is this. Totally relaxed. Do not let anything disturb the tranquil lake of earth. Why do you keep swallowing? Sorry, can you swallow a bit louder, please? Because I can still hear some of my own thoughts. Fuck. Uh, yes, total calm. And as we are approaching the end, I would like to leave you with yet another weird story from J. Shetty. All suffering belongs to all of us is the name of this part of the chapter. He writes, There is a Zen story about a young man who is world weary and dejected. With no plan or prospects, he goes to a monastery, tells the master that he is hoping to find a better path, but he admits that he lacks patience. Can I find enlightenment without all that meditation and fasting? He asks. I don't think I can handle it, is there another way? Perhaps, says the master, but you will need the ability to focus. Are there any skills you've developed? The young man looks down. He hasn't been inspired by his studies on, on any particular interest. Finally, he shrugs, well, I'm not bad at chess. The master calls over one of the monk elders and says, I'd like you and this young man to play a game of chess. Play carefully because I will cut off the head of the one who loses. I don't know why these monks are so unmonk like. I don't I don't think that murder is like a good way to go in teaching monk lessons, but okay. The young man breaks into a sweat. He's playing for his life. He plays weakly at first, but it soon becomes clear that his opponent's chess skills are, are fair at best. If he puts his mind to it, he will surely win. He soon loses himself in concentration and begins to beat the old monk. The master begins to sharpen his sword. Now the young man looks across the table, sees the wise, calm face of the old monk, who in his obedience and detachment has no fear of the death that certainly awaits him. The disillusioned man thinks, I can't be responsible for this man's death. His life is worth more than mine. Then the young man's play changes. He deliberately begins to lose. 
Without warning, the master flips the table over, scattering the pieces. Today, there will be no winner and no loser, he states. The losing monk's calm demeanor doesn't change, but the astonished young man feels a great sense of relief. The elder says to him, you have the ability to concentrate and you are willing to give your life for another. That is compassion. Join us and proceed in that spirit. You are ready to be a monk. And if I went to an ashram and then they told me to win a game of chess because that I would lose my life if I lose the game, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I would definitely not pay the tuition fee. As we're reaching the end of this video, let me just give you some overall conclusions about this book. First of all, as you can see, Jay has written his name in like silver on this. So definitely a very, very, um, he's definitely a very modest man. Uh, just like any monk. Not as bad as other self-help books that I've read. Uh, it could definitely do better. Definitely hits the same plot points. Talks about gratitude, talks about the ego, talks about, you know, not understanding mental health. But he does it by translating um, Hindu and Sanskrit stories into self-help. So um, I guess that's original because other self-helpers only have a uh, just Christian general stories that we've heard many times. And I guess these stories don't have a, you know, a um, saint, uh, they have a monk in them. So that makes them really different. But overall, the same ideas of toxic positivity have come back again and again. There's definitely more actionable advice in here. There's even a test at the end to see if you qualify as the maker, the creator, the guide, the leader. Um, I qualified as the guide, but I didn't, don't think that the test was good enough, to be honest. Like the test was way too specific and didn't, I couldn't find myself sometimes in the questions. Maybe I just don't belong in Jay's guide of characters. But overall, Jay Shetty as a self-help guru and as a person, he is just better than you. He is holier than thou. And that attitude really annoys me. This entire book has so many stories about how amazing and saint he is and they were at the ashram, etc. And I just, it's so irritating when somebody keeps telling you how good they are and how modest they were and how now they live in an $8.5 million villa in LA. And I just, I don't appreciate that. I do not appreciate that. I don't think for a second that Jay actually lives by the monk mentality or I think he just used that as his way to become famous and that's that on that. I don't think he actually practices this, what is in this book. Yeah, I would say don't buy it. It's very long. I, it took me two weeks to get through this book. I Granted, I, I took some breaks, but I, am, I would not recommend buying this book just as I don't recommend writing any self-help books. But I'm trying to manifest me actually writing a self-help book someday and uh, that will hopefully have the same exact plot points of gratitude, fear, it's not, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if I ever write a book, it will slap. It will be amazing, I promise you. So <laughs> with that being said, I think we've reached the end of the video. So thank you so much for watching, you guys. Please don't forget to subscribe. Like this video if you like it. Don't forget to check out my Patreon at the link in the description below. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye! Om Gandhi, Om Buddha, Om whatever other man, but Om definitely no women of wisdom.